Chapter thirty four of Historical Tales, Volume eight, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume eight, Russian by Charles Morris. Chapter thirty four At the Gates of Constantinople. From the days of Rurik down, a single desire, a single passion, we may say, has had a strong hold upon the Russian heart the desire to possess Constantinople, that grand gate city between Europe and Asia, with its control of the avenue to the southern seas. While it continued the capital of the Greek Empire, it was more than once assailed by Russian armies. After it became the metropolis of the Turkish dominion, renewed attempts were made. But Greek and Turk alike valiantly held their own, and the city of the Straits defied its northern foes. Through the centuries war after war with Turkey was fought, the possession of Constantinople their main purpose. But the Moslem clung to his capital with fierce pertinacity, and not until the year 1878 did he give way and a Russian army set eyes on the city so long desired. In 1875 an insurrection broke out in Bosnia and Herzegovina, two Christian provinces under Turkish rule. The rebellious sentiment spread to Bulgaria, and in 1876 Turkey began a policy of repression so cruel as to make all Europe quiver with horror. Thousands of its most savage soldiery were let loose upon the Christian population south of the Balkans, with full license to murder and burn, and a frightful carnival of torture and massacre began. More than a hundred towns were destroyed, and their inhabitants treated with revolting inhumanity. In the month of June, 1876, about 40,000 Bulgarians of all ages and sexes were put to death, many of the children being sold as slaves in the Turkish cities. Of all the powers of Europe, Russia was the only one that took arms to avenge these slaughtered populations. England stood impassive, the other nations held aloof, but Alexander the Second called out his troops, and once more the Russian battalions were sent en route for the Danube, with Constantinople as their ultimate goal. In June 1877 the Danube was crossed, and the Russian host entered Bulgaria, the Turks retiring as they advanced. But the march of invasion was soon arrested. The Balkan Mountains, nature's line of defense for Turkey, lay before the Russian troops, and on the high road to its passes stood the town of Plevna, a fortress which must be taken before the mountains could safely be crossed. The works were very strong, and behind them lay Osman Pasha, one of the boldest and bravest of the Turkish soldiers, with a gallant little army under his command. The defense of this city was the central event of the war. From July to September the Russians sought its capture, making three desperate assaults, all of which were repulsed. In October the city was invested with an army of 40,000 men under the intrepid General Skobolev, with a determination to win. But Osman held out with all his old stubbornness and continued his unflinching defense until starvation forced him to yield. He had lost his city, but had held back the Russian army for nearly half a year and won the admiration of the world. The fall of Plevna set free the large Russian army that had been tied up by its siege. What should be done with these troops, more than one hundred thousand strong? The Balkans, whose gateways Plevna had closed, now lay open before them, but winter was at hand, winter with its frosts and snows. An attempt to cross the mountains at this time, even if successful, would bring them before strong Turkish fortresses in midwinter with a chain of mountains in the rear over which it would be impossible to maintain a line of supplies. The prudent course would have been to put the men into winter quarters at the foot of the Balkans on the north, and wait for spring before venturing upon the mountain passes. The Grand Duke Nicholas, however, was not governed by such considerations of prudence, but determined at all hazards to strike the Turks before they had time to reorganize and recuperate. The army was therefore at once set in motion. General Gurko marching upon the Arabokanak, Radetsky upon the Shipka Pass. The story of these movements is a long one, but must be given here in a few words. The bitter cold, the deep snow, the natural difficulties of the passes, the efforts of the enemy all failed to check the Russian advance. Gurko forced his way through all opposition, took the powerful fortress of Sofia without a blow, and routed an army of fifty thousand men on his march to Philippopolis. Radetsky did even better, since he captured the Turkish army defending the Shipka Pass, 36,000 strong. 
the whole Turkish defense of the Balkans had gone down with a crash, and the Russians found themselves on the south side of the mountains with the enemy everywhere on the retreat, a broken and demoralized host. Meanwhile, what had become of the Turkish population of the Balkans and Rumelia? There were none of them to be seen. No fugitives were passed. Not a Turk was visible in Sofia. The whole region traversed up to Philippopolis seemed to have only a Christian population. But on leaving the last-named city the situation changed, and a terrible scene of bloodshed, death, and misery met the eyes of the marching hosts. It was now easy to see what had become of the Turks. They were here in multitudes in full flight for their lives. The Bulgarians had avenged themselves bitterly on their late oppressors. Dead bodies of men and animals, broken carts, heaps of abandoned household goods, and tatters of clothing seemed to mark every step of the way. Fierce and terrible had been the struggle, dreadful the result, Turks and Bulgarians lying thickly side by side in death. Here appeared the bodies of Bulgarian peasants horrible with gaping wounds and mutilations, the marks of Turkish vengeance. There beside them lay corpses of dignified old Turks, their white beards stained with their blood. While the men had died from violence, the women and children had perished from cold and hunger, many of them being frozen to death, the faces and tiny hands of dead children visible through the shrouding snows. The living were dragging their slow way onward through this ghastly array of the dead in a seemingly endless procession of wagons drawn by half-starved oxen, and bearing sick and feeble human beings and loads of household goods. Beside the laden vehicles the wretched, famine-stricken, worn-out fugitives walked, pushing forward in unceasing fear of their merciless Bulgarian foes. Farther on the scene grew even more terrible. The road was strewn with discarded bedding, carpets, and other household goods. In one village were visible the bodies of some Turkish soldiers whom the Bulgarians had stoned to death, the corpses half covered with the heaps of stones and bricks which had been hurled at them. Beyond this was reached a vast mass of closely packed wagons extending widely over roads and fields, not fewer than twenty thousand in all. The oxen were still in the yokes, but the people had vanished, and Bulgarian plunderers were helping themselves unresisted to the spoil. The great company, numbering fully two hundred thousand, had fled in terror to the mountains from some Russian cavalry, who had been fired upon by the escort of the fugitives, and were about to fire in return. Abandoning their property, the able-bodied had fled in panic fear, leaving the old, the sick, and the infants to perish in the snow, and their cherished effects to the hands of Bulgarian pilferers. In advance lay Adrianople, the ancient capital of Turkey and the second city in the empire. Here, if anywhere, the Turks should have made a stand. But news came that this stronghold had been abandoned by its garrison, that the wildest panic prevailed, and that the Turkish population of the city and the surrounding villages was in full flight. At daylight of the 20th of January the city was entered by the cavalry, and on the 22nd Skobolev marched in with his infantry, at once dispatching the cavalry in pursuit of the retreating enemy. The defense of Adrianople had been well provided for by an extensive system of earthworks, but not an effort was made to hold it, and an incredible panic seemed everywhere to have seized the Turks. Russia had almost accomplished the task for which it had been striving during ten centuries. Constantinople at last lay at its mercy. The Turks still had an army, still had strong positions for defense, but every shred of courage seemed to have fled from their hearts, and their powers of resistance to be at an end. They were in a state of utter demoralization and ready to give way to Russia at all points and accept almost any terms they could obtain. Had they decided to continue the fight, they still possessed a position famous for its adaptation to defense, behind which it was possible to hold at bay all the power of Russia. This was the celebrated position of Buyat Chekmej, a defensive line twenty-five miles from Constantinople and of remarkable military strength. The peninsula between the Black Sea and the Sea of Marmora is at this point only twenty miles wide, and twelve of those miles are occupied by broad lakes which extend inland from either shore. Of the remaining distance about half is made up of swamps which are almost or quite impassable, while dense and difficult thickets occupy the rest of the line. Behind this stretch of lake, swamp, and thicket there extends from sea to sea a ridge from four hundred to seven hundred feet in length the whole forming a most admirable position for defense. This ridge had been fortified by the Turks with redoubts, trenches, and rifle pits, which fully garrisoned and mounted with guns might have proved impregnable to the strongest force. The thirty thousand men within them could have given great trouble to the whole Russian army, 
and double that number might have completely arrested its march. Yet this great natural stronghold was given up without a blow, signed away with the stroke of a pen. On January 31st an armistice was signed, one of whose terms was that this formidable defensive line should be evacuated by the Turks who were to retire to an inner line while the Russians were to occupy a position about ten miles distant. It was no consideration for Turkey that now kept the Russians outside the great capital, but dread of the powers of Europe, which jealously distrusted an increase of the power of Russia, and were bent on saving Turkey from the hands of the Tsar. On February 12th an event took place that threatened ominous results. The British fleet forced the passage of the Dardanelles and moved upon Constantinople on the pretense of protecting the lives of British subjects in that city. As soon as news of this movement reached St. Petersburg, the Emperor telegraphed to the Grand Duke Nicholas, giving him authority to march a part of his army into Constantinople, on the same plea that the British had made. In response, the Grand Duke demanded of the Sultan the right to occupy a part of the environs of his capital with Russian soldiers, the negotiations ending with the permission to occupy the village of San Stefano on the Sea of Marmara, about six miles from the walls of the threatened city. What would be the end of it all was difficult to foresee. On the waters of the city floated the English ironclads with their mute threat of war. Around the walls Turkish troops were rapidly throwing up earthworks, leading officers in the Russian army chafed at the thought of stopping so near their longed-for goal, and burned with the desire to make a final end of the empire of the Turks and add Constantinople to the dominions of the Tsar. Yet though thus, as it were, on the edge of a volcano, their ordinary policy of delay and hesitation was shown by the Turkish diplomats, and the treaty of peace was not concluded and signed until the 3rd of March. The Russians had used their controlling position with effect, and the treaty largely put an end to Turkish dominion in Europe. The news of the signing was received with cheers of enthusiasm by the Russian army, drawn up on the shores of the Inland Sea, the Preobrzhensky, the famous regiment of Peter the Great holding the post of honor. Scarce a rifle shot distant, crowding in groups the crests of the neighboring hills and deeply interested spectators of the scene, appeared numbers of their late opponents. The news received, the cheering battalions wheeled into column, and past the Grand Duke went the army in rapid review, the march still continuing after darkness had descended on the scene. And thus ended the war, with the Russians within sight of the walls of that city which for so many centuries they had longed and struggled to possess. Only for the threatening aspect of the powers of Europe the Ottoman Empire would have ended then and there, and the Turk, encamped in Europe, would have ended forever his rule over Christian realms. End of chapter 34 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 35 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 35. The Nihilists and Their Work. In 1861, Alexander II, Emperor of Russia, signed a proclamation for the emancipation of the Russian serfs, giving freedom, by a stroke of the pen, to over fifty millions of human beings. In 1881, twenty years afterwards, when, as there is some reason to believe, he was about to grant a constitution and summon a parliament for the political emancipation of the Russian people, he fell victim to a band of revolutionists, and the thought of granting liberty to his people perished with him. This assassination was the work of the secret society known as the Nihilists. To say that their association was secret is equivalent to saying that we know nothing of their purposes other than their name and their deeds indicate. Nihilism signifies nothingness. It comes from the same root as annihilate, and annihilation of despots appears to have been the nihilist theory of obtaining political rights. This society reached its culmination in the reign of Alexander the Second, and despite the fact that he proved himself one of the mildest and most public-spirited of the czars, he was chosen as the victim of the theory of obtaining political regeneration by terror. Threats preceded deeds. The final years of the emperor's life were made wretched through fear and anxiety. His ministers were killed by the revolutionists. Some of the guards placed about his person became victims of the secret band. 
letters bordered with black and threatening the emperor's life were found among his papers or his clothes an explosive powder placed in his handkerchief injured his sight for a time a box of asthma pills sent him proved to contain a small but dangerous infernal machine he grew haggard through this constant peril his hair whitened his form shrank his nerves were unstrung in february eighteen seventy nine prince kropotkin governor-general of kharkov was killed by a pistol shot fired into his carriage window in april a nihilist fired five pistol shots at the czar in june the nihilists resolved to use dynamite with the purpose of destroying the governors general of several provinces and the czar and heir apparent among their victims was the chief of police while two of his successors barely escaped death the first attempt to kill the czar by dynamite took the form of excavating mines under three railroads on one of which he was expected to travel of these mines only one was exploded a house on the moscow railroad not far from that city was purchased by the conspirators and an underground passage excavated from its cellar to the roadway here auger holes were bored upward in which were inserted iron pipes communicating with dynamite stored below on the day when the emperor was expected to pass a woman nihilist named sofia perovskaya stood within view of the track with instructions to wave her handkerchief to the conspirators in the house at the proper moment the pilot train which always preceded the imperial train was allowed to pass the other train drew up to take water and was wrecked by the explosion of the mine fortunately for the emperor he was in the pilot train and out of danger some of the participants in this affair were arrested but their chief a german named hartmann escaped despite the utmost efforts of the police he made his way safely out of russia aided by nihilists at every step sometimes travelling on foot at other times in peasants carts finally crossing the frontier and reaching the nest of conspirators at geneva here he is supposed to have taken part with others in devising a new and what proved a fatal plot meanwhile a fresh attempt was made on the life of the czar on february fifth eighteen eighty alexander the second was to entertain at dinner in the winter palace a royal visitor prince alexander of hesse fortunately the czar was detained for a short time and the hour fixed for the dinner had passed when the party proceeded along the corridor to the dining hall the brief delay probably saved their lives for at that moment a tremendous explosion took place wrecking the dining hall and completely demolishing the guard-room which was filled with dead and dying victims sixty-seven in all it proved that a nihilist had obtained employment among some carpenters engaged in repairs within the palace and had succeeded in storing dynamite in a tool chest in his room he escaped and was never seen in st petersburg again two days later the corpse of a murdered policeman was found on the frozen surface of the neva a paper pinned to his breast threatening with death every governor-general except melikoff the successor of the murdered kropotkin their failures had proved so nearly successes that the nihilists were rather encouraged than depressed new plans followed the failure of old ones it was proposed to poison the emperor and his son the murder to be followed by a revolt of the disaffected in moscow and st petersburg the seizure of the palaces and the establishment of a constitutional government this plan however was given up as not likely to have the great moral effect which the nihilists hoped to produce a nihilist student in st petersburg had sent to the paris committee of the society a recipe for a formidable explosive of his invention a quantity of this dangerous substance was manufactured in france and secretly conveyed to st petersburg where bombs to contain it had been prepared the plans of the conspirators were now very carefully laid they did not propose to fail again if care could ensure success a cheesemonger's shop was opened on a street leading to the palace under which a mine was laid to the centre of the carriageway it being proposed to kill the czar when out driving if his carriage should take another route and follow the street leading from the catherine canal it was arranged to wreck it with bombs flung by hand the death of the czar was the sole thing in view the conspirators seemed willing freely to sacrifice their own lives to that object as regards the mine 
it was so heavily charged with dynamite that its explosion would have wrecked a great part of the anichkoff palace while killing the czar how the explosive material was conveyed from paris to russia is a mystery which was never successfully traced by the police the utmost care was taken at the frontiers to prevent the entrance of any suspicious substance for a year or two even the tea that came on the back of camels from china was carefully searched while all travellers were closely examined and all articles coming from western europe were almost pulled to pieces in the minuteness of the scrutiny the explosive is said to have looked like golden syrup and to have been sweet to the taste though acrid in its after effects a drop or two let fall on a hot stove flashed up in a brilliant sheet of flame though without smell or noise among the conspirators one of the most useful was sophia paraskaya the woman already named she was young of noble family handsome educated and fascinating in manner her beauty and high connections gave her opportunities which none of her fellow conspirators enjoyed and by her influence over men of rank and position she was enabled to learn many of the secrets of the court and to become familiar with all the precautions taken by the police to ensure the safety of the czar there was another woman in the plot a jewish girl named hesse helfman eight men constituted the remainder of the party the fatal day came in march eighteen eighty one on the morning of the twelfth melikoff minister of the interior told the czar that a man connected with the railroad explosion had just been arrested on whose person were found papers indicating a new plot he earnestly entreated alexander to avoid exposing himself on the next morning the czar went early to mass and subsequently accompanied his brother the grand duke michael to inspect his bodyguard sophia perovskaya had been apprised of these intended movements and informed the chief conspirators who at once determined that the deed should be done that day the lover of hesse helfman had been arrested and had at once shot himself papers of an incriminating character had been found in her house and it was feared that further delay might frustrate the plot so that the purpose of waiting until the czar and his son might be slain together was abandoned it was not known which street the czar would take if he took the one the mine was to be exploded if the other the bombs were to be thrown two men resikoff and elnikoff the latter a young man completely under sophia's influence were to throw the bombs she took a position from which she might signal the approach of the carriage as it proved the catherine canal route was taken the carriage approached everything wore its usual aspect there was nothing to excite suspicion suddenly a dark object was hurled from the sidewalk through the air and a tremendous report was heard resikoff had flung his bomb a baker's boy and the cossack footman of the czar were instantly killed but the intended victim was unhurt and the horses were only slightly wounded the coachman who had escaped injury wished to drive onward at speed out of the quickly gathering crowd but alexander who had seen his footman fall insisted on getting out of the carriage to assist him it was a fatal resolve as his feet touched the ground elnikoff flung his bomb it exploded at the feet of the czar with such force as to throw men many yards distant to the ground but proved fatal to only two elnikoff who was instantly killed and alexander who was mortally wounded his lower limbs and the lower part of his body being frightfully shattered he survived for a few hours in dreadful pain terrible as was the crime it was worse than useless the proposed rising did not take place a new czar immediately succeeded the dead one the hoped-for constitution perished with him upon whom it depended the nihilists instead of gaining liberal institutions had set back the clock of reform for a generation and perhaps much longer of the conspirators one of the men was killed one shot himself and two escaped the other four were executed of the women sophia was executed she knew too much and those who had betrayed to her the secrets of the court fearing that she might implicate them privately urged the new czar to sign her death warrant she held her peace and died without a word end of chapter thirty five chapter thirty six of historical tales volume eight russian this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 36, The Advance of Russia in Asia. The Emperor of Russia, Lord of his people, absolute autocrat over some 125 millions of the human race, today stands master not only to half the soil of Europe, but of more than a third of the far greater continent of Asia. To gain some definite idea of the total extent of this vast empire, it may suffice to say that it is considerably more than double the size of Europe, and nearly as large as the whole of North America. The tales already given will serve to show how the European Empire of Russia gradually spread outward from its early home in the city and state of Novgorod until it covered half the continent. How Russia made its way into Asia has been described in part in the story of the conquest of Siberia. The remainder needs to be told. It is now more than 300 years since the Cossack robber Yermak invaded Siberia and more than two centuries since that vast section of northern Asia was added to the Russian Empire. The great river Amur, flowing far through eastern Siberia to the Pacific, was discovered in 1643 by a party of Cossack hunters, who launched their boats on this magnificent stream and sailed down it to the sea. It was Chinese soil through which it ran, its waters flowing through the province of Manchuria, the native land of the emperors of China. But to this the Russian pioneers paid little heed. They invaded Chinese soil, built forts on the Amur, and for forty years war went on. In the end they were driven out, and China came to her own again. Thus matters stood until the year 1854. Six years before, an officer with four Cossacks had been sent down the river to spy out the land. They never returned, and not a word could be had from China as to their fate. In the year named, the Russians explored the river in force. China protested, but did not act and the whole vast territory north of the stream was proclaimed as russian soil forts were built to make good the claim and china helplessly yielded to the gigantic steel since then russia has laid hands on an extensive slice of chinese territory which lies on the pacific coast far to the south of the amur and has forcibly taken possession of the japanese island of sakhalin her avaricious eyes are fixed on the kingdom of korea and the whole of Manchuria may yet become Russian soil. Siberia is by no means the inhospitable land of ice which the name suggests to our minds. That designation applies well to its northern half, but not to the Siberia of the south. Here are vast fertile plains, prolific in grain, which need only the coming railroad facilities to make this region the granary of the Russian Empire. The great rivers and the numerous lakes of the country abound in valuable fish, large forests of useful timber are everywhere found fur-bearing animals yield a rich harvest in the icy regions of the north the mineral wealth is immense including iron gold silver platinum copper and lead precious stones are widely found among them the diamond emerald topaz and amethyst and of ornamental stones may be named malachite jasper and porphyry from which magnificent vases tables and other articles of ornament are made the region on the Amur and its tributaries is particularly valuable and rich, and a great population is destined in the future to find an abiding place in this vast domain. South of Siberia lies another immense extent of territory, stretching across the continent and comprising the great upland plain known as the steppes. On this broad expanse, rain rarely falls, and its surface is half a desert, unfit for agriculture, but yielding pasturage to vast herds of cattle, horses, and sheep the property of wandering tribes. Here is the great home of the nomad, and from these broad plains conquering hordes have poured again and again over the civilized world. From here came the Huns, who devastated Europe in Roman days, the Turks, who later overthrew the Eastern Empire, and the Mongols, who, led by Genghis and Tamerlan, committed frightful ravages in Asia and for centuries lorded it over Russia. Today, the greater part of this vast territory belongs to China, but westward from Chinese Mongolia extends a broad region of the steppes, bordering upon Europe on the west, and traversed by numerous wandering tribes known by the name of the Kyrgyz hordes. For many years, 
Russia, the great annexer, has been quietly extending her power over the domain of the hordes until her rule has become supreme in the land of the Kyrgyz, which in all maps of Europe is now given as part of Siberia. One by one military posts have been established in this semi-desert realm, the wandering tribes being at first cajoled and in the end defied. The glove of silk has been at first extended to the tribes, but within it the hand of iron has always held fast its grasp. The simple-minded chiefs have easily been brought over to the Russian schemes. Some of them have been won by money and soft words, others by some mark of distinction, such as a medal, a handsome saber, a cocked hat, or a gold-laced coat. Rather than give these up, some of them would have sold half the steps. They have signed papers of which they did not understand a word, and given away rights of whose value they were utterly ignorant. Thus insidiously has the power of the emperor made its way into the steps, fort after fort being built, those in the rear being abandoned as the country became subdued, and new forts arose in the south. Cities have arisen around some of these forts, of which may be mentioned Kopau and Vernoya, which today have thousands of inhabitants. Russia is thus surrounding the Kyrgyz hordes with civilization, says the traveller Atkinson, which will ultimately bring about a moral revolution in this country. Agriculture and other branches of industry will be introduced by the Russian peasant than whom no man can better adapt himself to circumstances. Michi, another traveller, gives in brief the general method of the Russian advance. It will be seen to be similar to that by which the Indian lands of the western United States were gained. The Cossacks at Russian stations make raids on their own account on the Kyrgyz and subject them to rough treatment. An outbreak occurs which it requires a military force to subdue. An expedition for this purpose is sent every year to the Kyrgyz steppes. The Russian outposts are pushed farther and farther south, more disturbances occur, and so the front is year by year extended, on the pretense of keeping peace. This has been the system pursued by the Russian government in all its aggressions in Asia. But this does not tell the whole story of the Russian advance in Asia. South of the Kyrgyz steppes lies another great and important territory known as Central Asia, or Turkestan. Much of this region is absolute desert, wide expanses of sand, waterless and lifeless, on which to halt is to court death. Only swift-moving troops of horsemen, or caravans carrying their own supplies, dare venture upon these arid plains. But within this realm of sand lie a number of oases, whose soil is well watered and of the highest fertility. Two mighty rivers traverse these lands, the Amu Daria, once known as the Oxus, and the Sir Daria, formerly the Jaxartes, both of which flow into the Sea of Aral. It is to the waters of these streams that the fertility of the oases is due, they being diverted from their course to irrigate the land. Three of these oases are of large size. Of these, Kiva has the Caspian Sea as its western boundary, Bukhara lies more to the east, while northeast of the latter extends Kokand. The deserts surrounding these oases have long been the lurking places of the Turkoman nomads, a race of wild and warlike horsemen, to whom plunder is as the breath of life, and who for centuries kept Persia in alarm, carrying off hosts of captives to be sold as slaves. The religion of Arabia long since made its way into this land, whose people are fanatical Mohammedans. Its leading cities, Kiva, Bukhara, and Samarkand, have for many centuries been centers of bigotry. For ages, Turkestan remained a land of mystery. No European was sure for a moment of life if he ventured to cross its borders. Van Beri, the traveler, penetrated it disguised as a dervish, after years of study of the language and habits of the Mohammedans, yet he barely escaped with his life. It is pleasant to be able to say that this state of affairs has ceased. Russia has curbed the violence of the fanatics and the nomads, and the once silent and mysterious land is now traversed by the Iron Horse. The first step of Russian invasion in this quarter was made in 1602. In that year, a Russian force captured the city of Kiva, but was not able to hold its prize. In 1703, during the reign of Peter the Great, the Khan of Kiva placed his dominions under Russian rule, and during the century... Kiva continued friendly, but after the opening of the 19th century, it became bitterly hostile. Meanwhile, Russia was making its way towards the Caspian and Aral Seas. In 1835, a fort was built on the eastern shore of the Caspian, and several armed steamers were placed on its waters. Four years later, war broke out with Kiva, and the Khan was forced to give up some Russian prisoners he had seized. 
In 1847, a fort was built on the Sea of Aral, at the mouth of the Sir Daria, whose waters formed the only safe avenue to the desert-girdled Khanate of Kokand. Steamers were brought in sections from Sweden, being carried with great labor across the desert to the inland sea, on whose banks they were put together and launched. Armed with cannon, they quickly made their appearance on the navigable waters of the Sir. The Amu Daria is not navigable, so that the Sir at that time formed the only ready channel of approach to Kokand, and from this to the other Khanates, none of which could be otherwise reached without a long and dangerous desert march. Russia, thus, by planting herself at the mouth of the Sir, had gained the most available position from which to begin a career of conquest in Central Asia. War necessarily followed these steps of invasion. In 1853, the Russians besieged and captured the fort of Akmashet on the Sir, thought by its holders to be impregnable. Up the river, bordered on each side by a narrow band of vegetation from which a desert spread away, the Russians gradually advanced. Finally planting a military post within 32 miles of Tashkent, the military key of Central Asia. Such was the state of affairs in 1862, when war arose between the Khanates themselves and the Emir of Bukhara invaded and conquered Kokand. Russia looked on, awaiting its opportunity. It came at length in an appeal from the merchants of Tashkent for protection. The protection came in true Russian style, a Cossack force marching into and occupying the town, which has since then remained in Russian hands. The movement of invasion went on until a large portion of Kokand was seized. This audacious procedure of the Muscovites, as the emir of Bukhara regarded it, roused that ruler to a high pitch of fury and fanaticism. He imprisoned Colonel Struve, an eminent Russian astronomer who was on a mission to his capital, and declared a holy war against the invading infidels. The emir had little fear of his foes, having what he considered two impassable lines of defense. Of these, the first was the desert, which enclosed his land as within a wall of sand. The second, and in his view the more impregnable, was the large number of saints that lay buried in Bokharan soil, before whose graves the infidel host would surely be stayed. He probably soon lost faith in the saints, for the Russians quickly drove his troops out of Kokand and then invaded Bokhara itself, defeating his troops near the venerable and famous city of Samarkand, of which they immediately afterwards took possession. These infidel assaults soon brought the holy war to an end, the emir being forced to cede Samarkand and three other places to Russia, the four being so chosen as to give the invaders full military control of the country. This disaster, which fell upon Bokhara in 1868, was repeated in Kiva in 1873. Bokharan troops aided the Russians, and Bokhara was rewarded with a generous slice of the conquered territory. Kiva was overthrown as quickly as the other oases had been, and the whole of Central Asia became Russian soil. It is true that a shadow of the old government is maintained, the Khans of Bokhara and Kiva still occupying their thrones, but they are mere puppets to move as the Tsar of Russia pulls the strings. As for Kokand, it has disappeared from the map of Asia, being replaced by the Russian province of Fergana. We have thus, in few words, told a long and vital story, that of the steps by which Russia gained its strong foothold in Asia, and extended its boundaries from the Ural Mountains and the Caspian Sea, to the Pacific Ocean and the boundaries of China, Persia, and India, all of which may yet become part of the vast Russian Empire, if what some consider the secret purpose of Russia be carried out. Asia has been won by the sword. It is being held by other influences. Schools have been founded among the Kyrgyz, and in newspapers printed in their language. Their plundering habits have been suppressed, agriculture is encouraged, and luxuries are being introduced into the steppes, with the result of changing the ideas and habits of the nomads. Thriving Cossack colonies have grown up on the plains, and the wandering barbarians behold with wonder the ways and means of civilization in their midst. The same may be said of Turkestan, in which violence has been suppressed and industry encouraged, while the Russian population, alike of the steppes and of the oases, is rapidly increasing. A railroad penetrates the formerly mysterious land. Trains roll daily over its soil, carrying great numbers of Asiatic passengers, and an undreamed-of activity of commerce has taken the place of the old-time plundering raids of the half-savage Turkoman horsemen. 
the russian is thoroughly adapted to deal with the asiatic half an asiatic himself in spite of his fair complexion he knows how to baffle the arts and overcome the prejudices of his new subjects the russian diplomatist has all the softness and suavity of his asiatic congeners he conforms to their customs and allows them to delay and prevaricate to their heart's content he is an adept in the art of bribery has emissaries everywhere and is much too deeply imbued with this Asiatic spirit for the bluntness of European methods. You must beat about the bush with a Russian, we are told. You must flatter them and humbug them. You must talk about everything but the thing. If you want to buy a horse, you must pretend that you want to sell a cow, and so work gradually round to the point in view. Thus the shrewd Russian has gained point after point from his Oriental neighbors and has succeeded in annexing a vast territory while keeping on the friendliest of terms with his new subjects. He has respected their prejudices, left their religions untouched, dealt with them in their own ways, and is rapidly planting the Muscovite type of civilization where Asiatic barbarism had for untold ages prevailed. No man can predict the final result of these movements. Asia has been in all ages the field of great invasions and of the sudden building up of immense empires but the movements of the muscovite conquerors have none of the torrent rush of those great invasions of the past the russian advances with extreme caution takes no risks and makes sure of his game before he shows his hand he prepares the ground in front before taking a step forward and all that he leaves in his rear falls into the strong folds of the imperial net gold and diplomacy are his weapons equally with the sword and in the progress of his arms we seem to see Europe marching into Asia with a solid and unyielding front. End of chapter 36 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 37 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris Chapter 37 The Railroad in Turkestan On the 24th of January, 1881, Edward O'Donovan, a daring traveller who had journeyed far through the wastes and wilds of Turkestan, found himself on a mountain summit not far removed from the northern boundary of Persia, from which his startled eyes beheld a spectacle of fearful import. Below him, the desert stretched in a broad level far away to the distant horizon. Near the foot of the range rose a great fortress, within which, at that moment, a frightful struggle was taking place. Bringing his field-glass to bear upon the scene, the traveller saw a host of terror-stricken fugitives streaming across the plain, and hot upon their steps a throng of merciless pursuers, who slaughtered them in multitudes as they fled. Even from where he stood, the white face of the desert seemed changing to a crimson hue. What the astounded traveller beheld was the death struggle of the desert Turkomans, the hand of retribution smiting those savage brigands who for centuries had carried death and misery wherever they rode. These were the Tekka Turkomans, the tribes who haunted the Persian frontier, and whose annual raids swept hundreds of captives from that peaceful land to spend the remainder of their days in the most woeful form of slavery. For a month previous, General Skobolev, the most daring and merciless of the Russian leaders, had besieged them in their great fort of Gioptepe, an earthwork nearly three miles in circuit and containing within its ample walls a desert nation, more than 40,000 in all, men, women, and children. On that day, fatal to the Turkoman power, Skobolev had taken the fort by storm, dealing death wherever he moved, until not a man was left alive within its walls except some hundreds of fettered Persian slaves. Through its gateways a trembling multitude had fled, and upon these miserable fugitives the Russian had let loose his soldiers, horse, foot, and artillery, with the savage order to hunt them to the death and give no quarter. Only too well was the brutal order obeyed. Not men alone, but women and children as well, fell victims to the sword, and only when night put an end to the pursuit did that terrible massacre cease. By that time, eight thousand persons, of both sexes and all ages, lay stretched in death upon the plain. Within the fort, thousands more had fallen, the women and children here being spared. 
Skobolev's report said that 20,000 in all had been slain. Such was the frightful scene which lay before O'Donovan's eyes when he reached the mountaintop, on his way to the Russian camp, a spectacle of horrible carnage which only a man of the most savage instincts could have ordered. Bloody Eyes, the Turkoman's name Skobolev, and the title fairly indicated his ruthless lust for blood. It was his theory of war to strike hard when he struck it all, and to make each battle a lesson that would not soon be forgotten. The Turkoman nomads have been taught their lesson well. They have given no trouble since that day of slaughter and revenge. Such was one of the weapons with which the Russians conquered the desert, the sword. It was succeeded by another, the iron rail. It is now some twenty years since the idea of a railroad from the Caspian Sea eastward was first advanced. In 1880, a narrow-gauge road was begun to aid Skobolev, but that daring and impetuous chief had made his march and finished his work before the rails had crept far on their way. Soon it was determined to change the narrow-gauge for a broad-gauge road, and General Anenkoff, a skillful engineer, was placed in charge in 1885 with orders to push it forward with all speed. It was a new and bold project which the Russians had in view. Never before had a railroad been built across so bleak a plain, a treeless and waterless expanse, stretching for hundreds of miles in a dead level, over which the winds drove at will the shifting sands, constantly threatening to bury any work which man ventured to lay upon the desert's broad breast. West of Bokhara and south of Kiva stretched the great desert of Karakum, touching the Caspian Sea on the west, the Amu Darya River on the east, the home of the wandering Turkomans, the born foes of the settled races, but from whom all thought of disputing the Russian rule had for the time been driven by Skobolev's death-dealing blade. The total length of the road thus ordered to be built, extending from the shores of the Caspian Sea, the outpost of European Russia, to the faraway city of Samarkand, the ancient capital of Timur the Tartar, and the very stronghold of Asiatic barbarism, was little short of a thousand miles, of which several hundred were bleak and barren desert. Two immense steppes, waterless and scorching hot in summer, lay on the route, while it traversed the oases of Kizil Arvat, Merv, Charjui, and Bokhara. In the northern section of the last lay the famous city of Samarkand, the eastern terminus of the road. The western terminus was at Usan Ada on the Caspian and opposite the petroleum region of Baku, perhaps the richest oil-yielding district in the world. General Anenkoff had special difficulties to overcome in the building of this road, of a kind never met with by railroad engineers before. Chief among these were the lack of water and the instability of the roadway, the wind at times manifesting an awkward disposition to blow out the foundation from under the ties, at other times to bury the whole road under acres of flying sand. These difficulties were got rid of in various ways. Fresh water, made by boiling the salt water of the Caspian and condensing the steam, was carried in vats or tons over the road to the working parties. At a later date, water was conveyed in pipes from the mountains to fill cisterns at the stations. Whence it was carried in canals or underground conduits along the line, every well and spring on the route being utilized. To overcome the shifting of the sand, near the Caspian it was thoroughly soaked with salt water, and at other places was covered with a layer of clay. But there are long distances where no such means could be employed, at least two hundred miles of utter wilderness, where the surface resembles a billowy sea, the sand being raised in loose hillocks and swept from the troughs between, flying in such clouds before every wind that an incessant battle with nature is necessary to keep the road from burial. To prevent this, tamarisk, wild oats, and desert shrubs are planted along the line, and, in particular, that strange plant of the wilderness, the saxol, whose branches are scraggly and scant, but whose sturdy roots sink deep into the sand, seeking moisture in the depths. Fascines of the branches of this plant were laid along the track and covered with sand, and in places palisades were built, of which only the tops are now visible. Yet, despite all these efforts, the sands creep insidiously on, and in certain localities workmen have to be kept employed, shoveling it back as it comes, and fighting without cessation against the forces of the desert and the winds. In the building of this road, and in this battling with the sands, Turkomans have been largely employed, having given up brigandage for honest labor, in which they have proved the most efficient of the various workmen engaged upon the road. 
aside from the peculiar difficulties above outlined the transcaspian railway was remarkably favored by nature for nearly the whole distance the country is as flat as a billiard table and the road so straight that at times it runs for twenty or thirty miles without the shadow of a curve in the entire distance there is not a tunnel and only some small cuttings have been made through hills of sand of bridges other than mere culverts there are but three in the whole length of the road the only large one being that over the amudaria this is a hastily built rickety affair of timber put up only as a makeshift and at the mercy of the stream if a serious rise should take place the whole road indeed was hastily made with a single track the rails simply spiked down and the work done at the rate of from a mile to a mile and a half a day before the bokharans fairly realized what was afoot the iron horse was careering over their level plains and the shrill scream of the locomotive whistle was startling the saints in their graves over such a road no great speed can be attained thirty miles an hour is the maximum and from ten to twenty miles the average speed while the stops at stations are exasperatingly long to travellers from the impatient west to the asiatics they are of no concern time being with them not worth a moment's thought in the operation of this road petroleum waste is used as fuel the refining works at baku yielding an inexhaustible supply the carriages are of mixed classes some being two stories in height each story of different class there are very few first-class carriages on the road as for the stations some of them are miles from the road that of bokhara being ten miles away this method was adopted to avoid exciting the prejudices of the asiatics who at first were not in favor of the road regarding it as a device of shaitan the spirit of evil yet the fire cart as they call it is proving very convenient and they have no objection to let this fiery satan haul their grain and cotton to market and carry themselves across the waterless plains the camel is being thrown out of business by this shrill-voiced prince of evil the road is being extended over the oases and will in the end bring all turkestan under its control it almost takes away one's breath to think of railway stations and timetables in connection with the old-time abiding place of the terrible tartar and of the iron horse careering across the empire of barbarism rushing into the metropolis of superstition and waking with the scream of the steam whistle the silent centuries of the orient nothing of greater promise than this planting of the railroad in central asia has been performed of recent years the son of the desert is to be civilized despite himself and to be taught the arts and ideas of the west by the irresistible logic of steel and steam but this enterprise is a minor one compared with that which russia has recently completed that of a railway extending across the whole width of siberia being with its branches more than five thousand miles long much the longest railway in the world work on this was begun in eighteen ninety and it is now completed to vladivostok the chief russian port on the pacific a traveller being able to ride from st petersburg to the shores of the pacific ocean without change of cars a branch of this road runs southward through manchuria to port arthur but as a result of the war with japan this has been transferred to china manchuria being wrested from the controlling grasp of russia it is a single track road but it is proposed to double track it throughout its entire length thus greatly increasing its availability as a channel of transport alike in war and peace all this is of the deepest significance the railroad in asia has come to stay and with its coming the barbarism of the past is nearing its end the sleeping giant of orientalism is stirring uneasily in its bed its drowsy senses stirred by the shrill alarum of the locomotive whistle new ideas and new habits must follow in the track of the iron horse the west is forcing itself into the east with all its restless activity in the time to come this whole broad continent is destined to be covered with railroads as with a vast spider web new industries will be established machinery introduced and the great region of the steppes famous in the past only as the starting point of conquering migrations must in the end become an active centre of industry the home of peace and prosperity a new-found abiding place of civilization and human progress end of chapter thirty seven recording by colleen mcmahon Chapter thirty eight of Historical Tales, Volume eight, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. Chapter 38 An Escape from the Mines of Siberia. The name Siberia calls up to our minds the vision of a stupendous prison, a vast open penitentiary, larger than the whole United States, a continental place of captivity, which for three centuries past has been the seat of more wretchedness and misery than any other land inhabited by the human race. To that far frozen land a stream of the best and worst of the people of Russia has steadily flowed, including prisoners of state, religious dissenters, rebels, Polish patriots, convicts, vagabonds, and all others who in any way gave offence to the authorities or stood in the way of persons in power. Not freedom of action alone, but even freedom of thought, is a crime in Russia. It is a land of innumerable spies, of secret arrest and rapid condemnation, in which the captive may find himself on the road to Siberia without knowing with what crime he is charged, while his friends, even his wife and family, may remain in ignorance of his fate. Every year a convoy of some 20,000 wretched prisoners is sent off to that dismal land, including the ignorant and the educated, the debased and the refined, men and women, young and old, the horror of exile being added to indescribably by this mingling of delicate and refined men and women with the rudest and most brutal of the convict class, all under the charge of mounted Cossacks, well-armed, and bearing long whips as their most effective arguments of control. It may be said here that the misery of this long journey on foot has been somewhat mitigated since the introduction of railroads and steamboats, and will very likely be done away with when the Trans-Siberian Railway is finished, but for centuries the horrors of the convict train have piteously appealed to the charity of the world, while the sufferings and brutalities which the exiles have had to endure stand almost without parallel in the story of convict life. The exiles are divided into two classes, those who lose all and those who lose part of their rights. Of a convict of the former class, neither the word nor the bond has any value. His wife is released from all duty to him, he cannot possess any property or hold any office. In prison he wears convict clothes, has his head half shaved, and may be cruelly flogged at the will of the officials, or murdered almost with impunity. Those deprived of partial rights are usually sent to western Siberia. Those deprived of total rights are sent to eastern Siberia, where their life as workers in the mines is so miserable and monotonous that death is far more of a relief than something to be feared. Many of the exiles escape, some from the districts where they live free, with privilege of getting a living in any manner available, others from the prisons or mines. The mere feat of running away is in many cases not difficult, but to get out of the country is a very different matter. The officers do not make any serious efforts to prevent escapes, and can be easily bribed to allow them, since they are enabled then to turn in the name of the prisoner as still on hand and charge the government for his support. In the gold mines the convicts work in gangs, and here one will lie in a ditch and be covered with rubbish by his comrades. When his absence is discovered he is not to be found, and at nightfall he slips from the trench and makes for the forest. To spend the summer in the woods is the joy of many convicts. They have no hope of getting out of the country, which is of such vast extent that winter is sure to descend upon them before they can approach the border but the freedom of life in the woods has for them an undefinable charm. Then, as the frigid season approaches, they permit themselves to be caught, and go back to their labor or confinement with hearts lightened by the enjoyment of their vagrant summer wanderings. There is in some cases another advantage to be gained. A twenty years convict who has escaped and lets himself be caught again may give a false name and avoid all incriminating answers through a convenient failure of memory. If not detected, he may in this way get off with a five-year sentence as a vagrant, but if detected his last lot is worse than his first, since the time he has already served goes for nothing. There is another peril to which escaping prisoners are exposed. The native tribes are apt to look upon them as game and shoot them down on sight. It is said that they receive three rubles for each convict they bring to the police, dead or alive. If you shoot a squirrel, they say, you get only his skin. But if you shoot a Varnak, convict, you get his skin and his clothing, too. 
atkinson the siberian traveller tells a remarkable story of an escape of prisoners which may be given an illustration of the above remarks one night in september eighteen fifty the people of barnaul a town in western siberia were roused from their slumbers by the clatter of a party of mounted cossacks galloping up the quiet street the story they brought was an alarming one siberia had been invaded by three thousand tartars of the desert who were marching towards the town nearly all the gold from the siberian gold mines lay in barnaul waiting to be smelted into bars and sent to st petersburg there was much silver also with abundance of other valuable government stores all this would form a rich booty for an army of nomad plunderers could they obtain it and the news filled the town with excitement and alarm as the night passed and the day came on other cossacks arrived with still more alarming news the three thousand had grown to seven thousand many of them armed with rifles who were burning the kalmuk villages as they advanced and murdering every man woman and child who fell into their hands some thought that the wild hordes of asia were breaking loose again as in the time of genghis khan and the terror of many of the people grew intense by noon the enemy had increased to ten thousand and people everywhere were flying before their advance hasty steps were taken for defence and for the safety of the gold and silver while orders were dispatched in all directions to gather a force to meet them on their way. But as the days passed on, the alarm began to subside. The number of invaders declined almost as rapidly as it had grown. They were not advancing upon the town. No army was needed to oppose them, and Cossacks were sent to stop the march of the troops. In the course of two days more, the truth was sifted from the mass of wild rumors and reports the ten thousand invaders dwindled to forty circassian prisoners who had escaped from the gold mines on the biryusa these fugitives had not a thought of invading the russian dominions they were prisoners of war who with heartless cruelty had been condemned to the mines of siberia for the crime of a patriotic effort to save their country and their sole purpose was to return to their far distant homes by the aid of small quantities of gold which they had managed to hide from their guards they succeeded in purchasing a sufficient supply of rifles and ammunition from the neighboring tribesmen, which they hid in a mountain cavern about seven miles away. There was no fear of the Tartars betraying them, as they had received for the arms ten times their value, and would have been severely punished if found with gold in their possession. On a Saturday afternoon near the end of July, 1850, after completing the day's labors, the Circassians left the mine in small parties, going in different directions this excited no suspicion as they were free to hunt or otherwise amuse themselves after their work they gradually came together in a mountain ravine about six miles south of the mines not far from this locality a stud of spare horses were kept at pasture and hither some of the fugitives made their way reaching the spot just as the animals were being driven into the enclosure for the night the three horse keepers suddenly found themselves covered with rifles and forced to yield themselves prisoners while their captors began to select the best horses from the herd. The Circassians deemed it necessary to take the herdsmen with them to prevent them from giving the alarm. Two of these also were skillful hunters and well acquainted with the surrounding mountain regions, and were likely to prove useful as guides. In all, fifty-five horses were chosen, out of the three or four hundred in the herd. The remainder were turned out of the enclosure and driven into the forest as if they had broken loose and their keepers were absent in search of them this done the captors sought their friends in the glen by whom they were received with cheers and before midnight the moon having risen the fugitives began their long and dangerous journey sunrise found them on a high summit which commanded a view of the gold mine they had left marked by the curling smoke which rose from fires kept constantly alive to drive away the mosquitoes the pests of the region taking a last look at their place of exile they moved on into a grassy valley where they breakfasted and fed their horses on they went, keeping a sharp watch upon their guides, day by day, until the evening of the fourth day found them past the crest of the range and descending into a narrow valley, where they decided to spend the night. Thus far, all had gone well. They were now beyond the Russian frontier and in Chinese territory, and as their guides knew the country no farther, they were set free and their rifles restored to them. Venison had been obtained plentifully on the march, and fugitives and captives alike passed the evening in feasting and enjoyment with daybreak the siberians left to return to the mine and the circassians resumed their route from this time onward difficulties confronted them they were in a region of mountains precipices ravines and torrents 
one dangerous river they swam but instead of keeping on due south the difficulties of the way induced them to change their course to the west alarmed probably by the vast snowy peaks of the tang nu mountains in the distance though if they had passed these all danger from siberia would have been at an end as it was after more than three weeks of wandering the nature of the country forced them towards the northwest until they came upon the eastern shore of the alton cool lake here was their final chance had they followed the lake southerly they might still have reached a place of safety but ill fortune brought them upon it at a point where it seemed easiest to round it on the north and they passed on hoping to reach its western shores but the baya the impassable torrent that flows from the lake forced them again many miles northward in search of a ford and into a locality from which their chance of escape was greatly reduced more than two months had passed since they left the mines and the poor wanderers were still in the vast siberian prison from which if they had known the country they might now have been far away the region they had reached was thinly inhabited by kalmuk tartars and they finally entered a village of this people with whose inhabitants they unluckily got into a broil ending in a battle in which several kalmuks were killed and the village burned to this event was due the terrifying news that reached barnul the alarm being carried to a cossack fort whose commandant was drunk at the time and sent out a series of exaggerated reports as for the fugitives they had in effect signed their death warrant by their conflict with the kalmuks the news spread from tribe to tribe and when the real number of the fugitives was learned the tribesmen entered savagely into pursuit determined to obtain revenge for their slain kinsmen the circassians were wandering in an unknown country the kalmuks knew every inch of the ground scouts followed the fugitives and after them came well-mounted hunters who rapidly closed upon the trail being on the evening of the third day but three miles away the circassians had crossed the baya and turned to the south but here they found themselves in an almost impassable group of snow-clad mountains on they pushed deeper and deeper into the chain still closely pursued the kalmuks so managing the pursuit as to drive them into a pathless region of the hills this accomplished they came on leisurely knowing that they had their prey safe at length the hungry and weary warriors were driven into a mountain pass where the pursuers who had hitherto saved their bullets began a savage attack rifle balls dropping fast into the glen the fugitives sought shelter behind some fallen rocks and returned the fire with effect but they were at a serious disadvantage the hunters who far outnumbered them and knew every crag in the ravines picking them off in safety from behind places of shelter from point to point the circassians fell back defending their successive stations desperately answering every call to surrender with shouts of defiance and holding each spot until the fall of their comrades warned them that the place was no longer tenable night fell during the struggle and under its cover the remaining fifteen of the brave fugitives made their way on foot deeper into the mountains abandoning their horses to the merciless foe at daybreak they resumed their march scaling the rocky heights in front here scanning the country in search of their pursuers not one of whom was to be seen they turned to the west a range of snow-clad peaks closing the way in front a forest of cedars before them seemed to present their only chance of escape and they hurried towards it but when within two hundred yards of the wood a puff of white smoke rose from a thicket and one of the fugitives fell the hunters had ambushed them on this spot and as they rushed for the shelter of some rocks near by five more fell before the bullets of their foes the fire was returned with some effect and then a last desperate rush was made for the forest shelter only four of the poor fellows reached it and of these some were wounded the thick underwood now screened them from the volley that whistled after them and they were soon safe from the effects of rifle shots in the tangled forest depths meanwhile the clouds had been gathering black and dense and soon rain and sleep began to fall accompanied by a fierce gale two small parties of kalmuks were sent in pursuit while the others began to prepare an encampment under the cedars the storm rapidly grew into a hurricane snow falling thick and whirling into eddies while the pursuers were soon forced to return without having seen the small remnant of the gallant band for three days the storm continued and then was followed by a sharp frost the winter had set in no further pursuit was attempted it was not needed nothing more was ever seen of the four circassians nor any trace of them found they undoubtedly found their last resting place under the snows of that mountain storm 
End of chapter 38 Recording by Colleen McMahon Chapter 39 of Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Historical Tales, Volume 8, Russian, by Charles Morris. The Sea Fight in the Waters of Japan. On the memorable Saturday of May 27, 1905, in far eastern waters in which the guns of warships had rarely thundered before, took place an event that opened the eyes of the world as if a new planet had swept into its ken, or a great comet had suddenly blazed out in the eastern skies. It was that of one of the most stupendous naval victories in history, won by a people who fifty years before had just begun to emerge from the dim twilight of medieval barbarism. Japan, the nemesis of the east, had won her maiden spurs on the field of warfare in her brief conflict with china in eighteen ninety four but that was looked upon as a fight between a young gamecock and a decrepit barnyard fowl and the western world looked with a half pitying indulgence upon a spectacle of the long slumbering orient serving its apprenticeship in modern war yet the rapid and complete triumph of the island empire over the leviathan of the asiatic continent was much of a revelation of the latent power that dwelt in that newly aroused archipelago and when in nineteen three japan began to speak in tones of menace to a second leviathan that of eastern europe and northern asia the world's interest was deeply stirred again would little of japan dare attack a european power and one so great and populous as russia with half Asia already in its clasp, with strong fortresses and fleets within striking distance, and with a continental railway over which it could pour thousands of armed battalions. The idea seemed preposterous. Many looked upon the attitude of Japan as the madness of temerity, and when on February 6, 1904, the echo of the guns at Port Arthur was heard, the world gave a gasp of astonishment and alarm were there any among us then who believed it possible for little japan to triumph over the colossus it had so daringly attacked if any they were very few it is doubtful if there was a man in russia itself who dreamed of anything but eventual victory with probably the adding of the islands of japan to its chaplet of orient pearls true the success of the attack on their fleet was a painful surprise and when they saw their great ironclads locked up in port arthur harbor it was cause for annoyance but if the fleet had been taken by surprise the fortress was claimed to be impregnable the army was so powerful and accustomed to victory over its foes in asia and it was with an amused contempt that their half-barbarian foes and confidence in rapid and brilliant triumph that the muscovite cohort streamed across asia with arms in hand and hope in heart we do not suppose to tell here what followed the world knows it men read with an interest they had rarely taken in foreign affairs of the rapid and stupendous success of the little soldiers of nippon the indomitable valor of the troops the striking skill of their leaders the breadth and completeness of their tactics the training and discipline of the men the rare hygienic condition of their camps their impetuosity in attack their persistence in pursuit in short the sudden advent of an army with all the requisites of a victorious career as pitted against the ill-handled myriads of russia not wanting in brute courage but sadly lacking in efficient leadership and strategical skill in their commanders back went the russian boats mile by mile league by league steadily pressed northward by the unrelenting persistence of the island warriors while on the Laotung peninsula the besieging forces crept on foot by foot a carrying apparently nothing for wounds or death caring only for the possession of the fortress which they had been sent to win we should like to record some victories for the russians but the annals of the war tell us of none outgeneraled and driven back from their strong position to the yalu river decisively beaten in the great battle of lao yang checked in their offensive movement on the shake river with immense loss, and finally utterly defeated in the desperate two-week struggle at Mukden, 
the field warfare ended in the two great armies facing each other at harbin with months of maneuvering before them meanwhile the campaign in the peninsula had gone on with like desperate efforts and final success of the japanese port arthur surrendering to its irresistible besiegers on the opening day of nineteen five with it fell the russian fleet which had been cooped up in its harbor for nearly a year defeated and driven back in its every attempt to escape its flagship the petrovelosk sunk by a mine on april thirteenth nineteen four carrying down admiral makaroff and nearly all its crew the remnant of the fleet being finally sunk or otherwise disabled to save them from capture on the surrender of port arthur to the besieging forces such in very brief epitome were the leading features of the conflict on land and its earlier events on the sea we must now return to the great naval battle spoken of above which calls for detailed description alike from its being the closing struggle of the contest and from its extraordinary character as a phenomenal event in maritime war the loss of the naval strength of russia in eastern waters led to a desperate effort to retrieve the disaster by sending from the baltic every warship that could be got ready with the hope that a strong fleet on the open waters of the east would enable russia to regain its prestige as a naval power and deal a deadly blow at its foe by closing the waters upon the possession of which the islanders depended for the support of their armies in manchuria this supplementary fleet under admiral rojetsvinsky set sail from the port of libau on october sixteenth nineteen four beginning its career inauspiciously by firing impulsively on some english fishing boats on the twenty first with the impression that these were japanese scouts this hasty act threatened to embroil russia with another foe the ally of japan but it passed off with no serious results entering the mediterranean and passing through the suez canal the fine fleet under rojesvinsky nearly sixty vessels strong loitered on its way with wearisome deliberation dallying for a protracted interval in the waters of the indian ocean and not passing singapore on its journey north till april twelfth it looked almost as if its commander feared the task before him six months having now passed since it left the baltic on its very deliberate cruise the second russian squadron under admiral nebogatov did not pass singapore until may fifth it being the thirteenth before the two squadrons met and combined on the twenty second they were seen in the waters of the philippines heading northward the news of this flashed by cable from the far east to the far west put europe and america on a qui vive in eager anticipation of startling events quickly to follow meanwhile where was admiral togo and his fleet for months he had been engaged in the work of bottling up the russian squadron at port arthur since the fall of the latter place and the destruction of the warships in its harbor he had been lying in wait for the slow-coming baltic fleet doubtless making every preparation for the desperate struggle before him and doing this in so silent and secret a method that the world outside knew next to nothing of what was going on the astute authorities of japan had no fancy for heralding their work to the world and not a hint of the movements or whereabouts of the fleet reached men's ears as the days passed on the russian ships steamed still northward the anxious curiosity as to the location of the japanese fleet grew painfully intense the expected intention to waylay rojetsvinsky in the southern straits had not been realized and as the russians left the philippines in their rear the question where is togo grew more insistent still the extraordinary skill he had lain long in ambush not to whisper as to the location of his fleet being permitted to make its way to the western world and when rojetsvinsky ventured into the yawning jaws of the korean strait he was in utter ignorance of the lurking place of his grimly waiting foes before rojetsvinsky lay two routes to choose between the more direct one to vladivostok through the narrow korean strait or the longer one eastward to the great island of honshu which he would take was in doubt and in which togo awaited him no one knew the skilled admiral of japan kept his counsel well doubtless satisfied in his own mind that the russians would follow the more direct route 
and quietly but watchfully awaiting their approach. It was on May 22nd, as we have said, that the Russian fleet appeared off the Philippines, the greatest naval force that the mighty Muscovite Empire had ever sent to sea, the utmost it could muster after its terrible losses at Port Arthur. Five days afterwards, on the morning of Saturday, May 27th, this proud army of men of war steamed into the open throat of the Straits of Korea, steering for victory in Vladivostok. On the morning of Monday, the 29th, a few battered fragments of this grand fleet were fleeing for life from their swift pursuers. The remainder lay with their drowned crews on the sea bottom, or were being taken into ports of victorious Japan. In those two days had been fought to a finish the greatest naval battle of recent times, and Japan had won the position of one of the leading naval powers of the world. On that Saturday morning, no dream of such a destiny troubled the souls of those in the Russian fleet. They were passing into the throat of the channel between Japan and Korea. But as yet, no sign of foemen had appeared, and it may be that numbers on board the fleet were disappointed, for doubtless the hope of battle and victory filled many ardent souls on the Russian ships. The sun rose on the new day and sent its level beam across the seas, on which as yet no hostile ship had appeared. The billowing water spread broad and open before them, and it began to look as if those who hoped for a fight would be disappointed. Those who desired a clear sea and an open passage would be gratified. No sails were visible on the waters except those of small craft, which scudded hastily for shore on seeing the great army of warships on the horizon. Fishing craft, most of these, though doubtless among them were the scout boats which the watchful Togo had on patrol with orders to signal the approach of the enemy's fleet. But as the day moved on, the scene changed. A great ship loomed up, steering into the channel. Then another and another, the vanguard of a battle fleet steaming straight southward. All doubt vanished. Togo had sprung from his ambush, and the battle was at hand. It was a rough sea, and the coming vessels dashed through heavy waves as they drove onward to the fray. From the flagship of the fleet of Japan steamed the Admiral's signal not unlike the famous signal of nelson at trafalgar the defense of our empire depends upon this action you are expected to do your utmost northward drove the russians drawn up in double column the day moved on until noon was passed and the hour of two was reached a few minutes later the first shots came from the foremost russian ships they fell short and the japanese waited until they came nearer before replying then the roar of artillery began, and from both sides came a hail of shot and shell, thundering on opposing hulls or rending the water into foam. From two o'clock on Saturday afternoon until two o'clock on Sunday morning, that iron storm kept on with little intermission. The huge twelve-inch guns sending their monstrous shells hurtling through the air, the smaller guns raining projectiles on battleships and cruisers, until it seemed as if nothing that floated could live through that terrible storm. Never in the history of naval warfare had so frightful a cannonade been seen. Its effect on the opposing fleets was very different. For months Togo had kept his gunners in training, and their shell-fire was accurate and deadly, hundreds of their projectiles hitting the mark and working dire havoc on the Russian ships and crews. While to judge from the little damage done, the return fire would seem to have been wild and at random. Either the work of training his gunners had been neglected by the Russian admiral, or they were demoralized by the projectiles from the rapid-fire guns of the Japanese, which swept their decks and mowed down the gunners at their posts. This fierce and telling fire soon had its effect. Ninety minutes after it began, the Russian armored cruiser Admiral Nakamov went reeling to the bottom with the greater part of her crew of six hundred men. Next to succumb was the repair ship Kamachatka, badly hurt in the battle, and her steering gear was later disabled. Then a shell put her engines out of service, and shortly after her bow rose in the air and her stern sank, and with a tremendous roar she followed the Nakamov to the depths. Around the Borodino, one of the largest of the Russian battleships, clustered five of the Japanese, pouring in their fire so fiercely that flames soon rose from her deck and the wounded monster seemed in sore distress. This was Rojasvinsky's flagship, 
and the enemy made it one of their chief targets sweeping its decks until the great ship became a veritable shambles admiral rojetvinsky wounded and his ship slowly settling under him was transferred in haste to a torpedo boat destroyer and as evening came on the huge ship still fighting desperately turned turtle and vanished beneath the waves as for the admiral the destroyer which bore him was taken and he fell a prisoner into japanese hands previous to this three other battleships the lessoy the veliki and the Oslabaya, had met with a similar fate and shortly after sundown the navarian followed its sister ships to the yawning depths the fiery assault had quickly thrown the whole russian army into disorder while the japanese skillfully maneuvered to press the russians from side and rear forcing them towards the coast where they were attacked by the japanese column there advancing in this way the fleet was nearly surrounded the torpedo boat flotilla being thrown out to intercept those vessels that sought to break through the deadly net with the coming on of darkness the firing from the great guns ceased the russian fleet being this time hopelessly beaten but the torpedo boats now came actively into action keeping up their fire through most of the night when sunday morning dawned the shattered remnants of the russian fleet were in full flight for safety hotly pursued by the japanese who were bent on preventing the escape of a single ship the roar of guns began again about nine o'clock and was kept up at intervals during the day new ships being bagged from time to time by togo's victorious fleet while others shot through and through followed their brothers of the day before to the ocean depths the most notable event of this day's fight was the bringing to bay off leoncourt island of a squadron of five battleships comprising the division of admiral nebuchadnezzar togo in the battleship mikasa commanded the pursuing squadron which overtook and surrounded the russian ships pouring in a terrible fire which soon threw them into hopeless confusion not a shot came back in reply and togo seeing their helpless plight signaled a demand for their surrender in response the japanese flag was run up over the russian standard and these five ships fell into the hands of the islanders without an effort at defence the confusion and dismay on board was such that an attempt to fight could have led only to their being sent to the bottom with their crews it was a miserable remnant of the proud russian fleet that escaped including only the cruiser almez and a few torpedo boats that came limping into the harbor of vladivostok with the news of the disaster and the cruisers oleg aurora and jemchug under rear admiral inquest that straggled in a damaged condition into manila harbor a week after the great fight aside from these the russian fleet was annihilated its ships destroyed or captured the total loss according to admiral togo's report being eight battleships three armored cruisers three coast defense ships and an unenumerated multitude of smaller vessels while the loss in men was four thousand prisoners and probably twice that number slain or drowned the most astonishing part of the report was that the total losses of the japanese were three torpedo boats no other ships being seriously damaged while the loss in killed and wounded was not over eight hundred men it was a fight that paralleled in all respects except that of dimensions of the battling fleets the naval fights at manila and santiago in the spanish-american war what followed this stupendous victory needs not many words to tell on land and sea the russians had been fought to a finish to protract the war would have been but to add to their disasters peace was imperative and it came in the following september the chief result being that the russian career and conquest in eastern asia was stayed and japan became the master spirit in that region of the globe end of chapter thirty nine end of historical tales volume eight russian by charles morris